Hey, Prepared Performers! Here is episode 12 of the Prepared Performer podcast. Hey, Prepared Performers! Today you are in for a crazy, amazing treat. My friend Ellen Marie Marsh is here with us. Let's Hello! <laughs> So good to see you. Good to see you. She is a spoonful of sugar and I can't wait. Hooray. Okay. Um, Ellen, I just want to jump right in. First okay. of all, you guys, she's had like how, four Broadway shows. You're in your fourth Broadway show. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. I fourth Broadway show. And um, we worked at Ellen Stardust Diner together. Singing. The Ellen Stardust Diner. The world famous Ellen mm-hmm. Stardust Diner. It is not her diner. There's another Ellen. <laughs> not my diner people always used to ask me that all the time that's so funny I, I'm sure they did actually <laughs> just to get that out in the open but um tell us first of all like what your training was in the land of musical theater in the land of musical theater I grew up in the bay area so um you know in northern california yeah. hello southern california and um so it was really uh arts rich um in terms of um so theater yeah, theater, dance, voice. Um, I had several, you know, voice teachers. I went to a high school that was really re- did these phenomenal performances. Um, and and then I did theater in the community. Um, and those pe- they were so professional. The sh- I look back at the shows now, and they were amazing. Really? And then. Um, youth roles in those shows or were you doing shows where you were like in the ensemble of 42nd Street? In a- yeah, it was more like that. It was more like, um, you know, I was like a Bobby Soxer in Guys and Dolls and I had like a little solo and sit down, you rock in the boat and, you know, things like that. And then, you know, like a chorus line, I did Deanna. So it was like younger people and just things like that with um, people in the community. And, and then somebody, and then um, Beach Like a Babylon, was um like my favorite show back then and that was my like dream was to be in beach blanket babylon and i learned that like people could like be in theater and make a living which was crazy and so then i told my parents that that's what i wanted to do they were like of course you do um okay family who were in the theater or in the arts or no no i was a weirdo we were a sports family awesome we all played sports as well i was such a weirdo um, I still am, but, um, and then I went to Emerson in Boston, okay. which I loved. I majored in acting. Um, and, and, and then I, do you feel like they gave you much, this is like my obsession right now and has been, do you feel like they gave you much training in the world of the business of show business? Like how to actually get jobs? That's a really good question. No. <laughs> That is but, the answer I usually hear. <laughs> but I'm of a different generation. I'm of like before the interwebs. That's true. So it was, it's totally different. And we occasionally would have an alum um, come and talk to us about like making it in New York. And that was the most fascinating thing. Again, before the internet and before all of these resources like podcasts and videos and yeah. chat boards and all these things that these kids these kids nowadays have at their fingertips so i think it was just like a, a times thing and new york was this like mystical place with these magical performers and now kids you know follow laura bonanti on twitter and right. tweet to lin manuel and it's all um you know much more accessible and it just was different and i don't think my school yeah, no. I mean, I, I just showed up to New York. I showed up with, a, you know, a dance belt and a tube of chapstick. And I was like, you know, what do I do now? Right. I get a backstage? Oh, okay. Let me go grab a backstage and show up to auditions I'm not appropriate for. Which the I, backstage was like this big. Remember that? Like, yeah. That huge. You'd have to lay it out on the floor and circle things. Circle things and like pull it out of your backpack and, and yeah, yeah. It, was, it was for sure a different time. It doesn't seem like that long ago. But when I tell kids that I teach, that's what I did. They're like, why didn't you Google where the audition was? I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) Um, so no. So I don't think my my school prepared me. I think it was, I think they do a bit of a better job now. Um, But nope, I just showed up and figured it out. Yeah. 
So what was your first professional gig? Like, would you consider those shows in, uh, back in the Bay Area to be your first professional shows, like the community yeah. theater? Or what would you say was your first show? Where you no, I think your show? first professional show is where you collect a paycheck. Right. And um, my first place I co collected a paycheck was uh, Bush Gardens Williamsburg. Yes. Yeah, I, and I did this show called American Jukebox, and hold on, I have an itch in my ear. American Jukebox with, I am not kidding, some of the most talented people to this day that I've ever performed with. I think seven out of, uh, 21. Okay. I think seven out of 10 of us have been on Broadway out of the 10 people in the cast. Amazing. Like six or seven of us. Um, like most of them like gypsies like Gracie and Kingsbury's in the color purple right now Anthony Wayne was in Priscilla with me and he was in anything goes and he was in Pippin and it was just like this crazy thing and and I we sang and danced in like 100 degree heat and I was like I'm making I'm making $400 a week what and it was the best best thing ever it was yeah. so fun to awesome. collect a paycheck just like singing and dancing is like, no. whoa. How does that even happen? <laughs> like yeah. unicorn. So while you were doing that, were you going to auditions, you know, outside of that as well? What kind of hours were you keeping at that job? We did go to auditions. We would sort of caravan up to New York in audition. Mm -hmm. But actually what was really fun about that, <clears throat> I think Bush Gardens is really known for having really great talent. I think they still are. And, um, a casting director from a cruise ship came and like scooped us all up to go work on cruise ships. Yes. What so then, so then we all went and worked on cruise ships. Like again, 10 or 12 of us out of the whole park, like went and went and worked on cruise ships. They didn't even have a audition. So you went into that knowing all those people as well. That yeah. Was so cool. Yeah. It was so fun. And then, but we did, we came up to New York and we would see shows and we would, we would go to big old casting calls just because it was fun. Remember when auditioning was fun? We're like, yeah, let's do that for fun. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was great. You just, you, it, it, it's such like a metaphor because you never know what job is going to lead to the next. Right. We had no idea these casting directors from like cruise ships hey, were so in the audience. That, like, so what do mm -hmm. you think? I mean, at a job working at a, you know, a park like Bush Gardens, I'm sure there are people who phone it in or whatever, you know don't necessarily always give it their best and whatnot. But the mm -hmm. fact that that casting director was there and what if mm -hmm. maybe you had kind of sloughed off that day, like what did that show you about work ethic? Um, I'm going to toot my own horn. I just had a conversation with a friend of mine because I said that, you know, it's really, really hard on any level, whether it be on Broadway or a cruise ship or a theme park, you know, like, let's say you're in a short run and you have like 12 chances to do it. You're going to give it 150% for those 12 chances. Right. But when, you know, I've been in Kinky Boots now for three years Great. and, you know, eight shows a week, 52 and weeks a year. You're covering things as well, right? So sometimes you're, you change. You guys, if you don't yeah. recognize Ellen because she looks really beautiful right now. <laughs> she wears the most amazing wig you will ever see it's pretty amazing it's it's pretty famous I think but the um favorite thing was when it was like the picture was on the side of the bus oh my god something on facebook like if you know when i asked to have when i dreamed of having my oh my gosh i keep hearing this noise because i'm sitting on my keyboard do you hear that? oh no i don't hear it oh it's my oh i forget this mic is so awesome it drowns that stuff out but my butt is on my keyboard right now Oops. oh nice um but yeah she was like when I dreamed of being on the side of the bus, this is not exactly what I was talking about. Uh, yeah, it's be more specific with your dreams. Be a little more specific. I had a friend who was like in a massive poster in 42nd Street and he was blinking. He was like, like a, oh, yeah. <laughs> and he, he, again, be more specific with what you're asking for. But um, with work ethic, it's you never know who's in the audience. I mean, so, I, I love this story. Sada Ramirez. Mm -hmm was in um spam a lot you know right. what's her yeah. toes the lady of the lake or yeah. yeah and you know she's on Grey's anatomy and like the story goes that like somebody from abc said hey what show do you want to be on 
because they were like in the audience, you know, yeah. you just never know. And, and again, more than that, more than getting a job, you never know who's seeing their first Broadway show. You never know who's had a really bad day. You never know who's seeing their last Broadway show. You never know. You never know who, honestly, who you're going to change their life. And it, with our show, our show is, you change, our motto is you change the world when you change your mind. Mm -hmm. And um, I, we, I really, really do believe we change minds and we change hearts. I really, really believe it because I've seen it over the years. Even just and, the um, title of the show, I think, because everybody, when hearing the title of the show, I remember I, when I saw it with you guys, I mean, I saw it really early too. I was so, it was so awesome. But coming back and Thank using you. the music for my dance classes, I was like, yeah. how am I going to tell these kids when they ask me what this is from? But now everyone yeah. just says Kinky Boots. And it's exactly. It's so inspirational, right? It's, yeah. it's really, really so inspirational. It just lifts people up. People can't help but seriously, like, dance out of the audience. It's, yeah. it's amazing. It's great. So, yeah, but, you know, work ethic is something – I don't know if it's learned or I just – uh, you know, I think it's demanded by the teachers I grew up with. You always want to make the people who you admire happy, like Jerry Mitchell. You know, I would, if he's ever in the audience and he does sneak into the audience, I would always want him to be proud, you know? Right. right. I love it. Yeah. Um, okay. Tell us about when you found your, when you got your first Broadway show, what that experience was like. Uh, my first Broadway show, uh, was crybaby and i had forgotten that you did until i you saw, until you sent me your stuff which i remember that now but i had totally forgot yeah well kind of did it yeah. I mean, um and i auditioned for it and i went in for this one part um that i ended up getting in the end but i had gone in for it and then they sort of like tried to fit me in somewhere else and then somewhere else and then i went to the last audition i was like okay are you seriously calling me in for this again uh, I was going to the Bravo A-list awards with my neighbor and I was like, okay, let me just go, I'm gonna go to this audition really fast. And then we're going to go to the Bravo A-list awards. Like who cares about this audition? And, um, I went to the audition. I ran home. I lived at 49th and 10th <clears throat> that day. I didn't even give another thought to it. I get in the cab with my neighbor and my agent call, calls me and goes, are you sitting down? I was like, yeah, I'm in a cab on the way to the Bravo A-list awards. Like who knows where I got that ticket from? <laughs> And, um, and then he was like, you're going to make your Broadway debut in Crybaby. And I was like, with my neighbor, I was like, ah! and I told the cab driver, I was like, I'm going to be on Broadway. Do you care? And okay. like, right away after the, like that soon after the audition that it was. A oh yeah. Time. Within like an hour and a half. Yeah. That's yeah. Crazy, right? Yeah, like, it was like, yeah. yeah, like they had, I had like left the room, you know, when it gets down to there, the end. They're really only debating between like a couple of people, you know, like two, three, four, maybe four people. And they just sit in that room till they make a decision yeah. and then, and then they call, you know? So yeah, it was, I had just changed my clothes. Yeah, it was crazy. A uh, couple shows were a little different. Pris uh, Priscilla, they told me there. Oh, that's Be awesome. Because I had just been in Enron, which was a big fat flop. And I think they felt bad for me. So they pulled me into the office and they said, Hey, do you want to go back to Broadway? Oh, that's cute. I bet that's <laughs> for them too to be able to see, to be able to give that information rather Absolutely. than having a phone call like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. My, my a girlfriend of mine is a, is an amazing casting director, and she said her favorite days are giving people their Broadway debuts. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's pretty cool. How yeah. How did you um, get your first agent? Like, how was how did you first find representation? I someone at Ellen Stardust Diner. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't remember who said my agent's upstairs. She's going to come down, sing for her. Amazing. And then she, yeah. And then she was. She would avoid that place like the plague, right? She was literally, her office was literally upstairs. Oh, and she. I thought you meant she was like sitting in the mez. <clears throat> no, no, no. Her office was upstairs and she was coming down. I can't for the life of me think of who it was. But it was through someone, yeah. you know? It's all, it's, that's what I always say. People ask me, should I do this? Should I like submit my headshot and resume? I'm like, no, it's all about FaceTime. It's all about being in someone's face and meeting them and connecting with them and looking at them and making a joke and making them remember you. And totally. I always, yeah. I'm like so big about the connecting thing and about making mm -hmm. sure, I don't know if you've heard me talk about my quesadilla story. Do you know about that? No. That I always say that I make all my students write 
five to 20 things that make them awesome as a person, not about uh-huh. them as a performer, but as uh-huh. human beings. Uh-huh. And um, I always say that everyone has something that makes them awesome, even if it's just that they make an amazing quesadilla. And if you, yeah. and you talk about your amazing quesadilla recipe, people uh-huh. to remember you. Or you I know, like that. I'm going to take that. Yeah, I like that. That's like That's my good. leggings. I love my leggings. Yeah. Um, yeah. So awesome. Um, or having where your husband's British. Yes. Yes. I mean like that's like weird things like that, that yeah. you end up connecting with someone about and have something to talk to yeah. about. Or where you're from or working. <clears throat> that's, that's a skill. That's for sure a skill. Just yeah. basic how to connect with someone. Do you like sports? Do you like art? What was the last Broadway show you saw? Did you watch the Oscars? You know, anything that connects you to someone else. Totally. I think that's a life skill, you know, not just, and it's, you know. It's not just, um, you know, specific to theater, obviously. Yeah. It's, it's so good in anything in life, but totally, especially with that. And I think sometimes yeah. people think, oh, if I just submit, if I just do a huge mailing to all these people that somehow that's going to work. But I think so much of it is about actually. Yeah. You're you know, just, I mean, think of, you know, if I were to see someone on a piece of paper, I'm like, oh, I like her hair. Oh, uh, should I get a quesadilla for lunch? I mean, it's just. Yeah. You know, there's nothing like meeting someone and, and having some kind of a connection or an impact, even if it doesn't result in an immediate, uh, you know, networking thing. It's still somebody down the line that you're going to meet and be like, oh, yeah, I met them at someone. So, you know, it's yeah. but that's just like life, you know, that's just you're also going to have the experience of what it's like to connect with a real human being so that when you're mm-hmm. ready to connect with the person that is going to be the thing that you're going to set help them with something or they're going to help you with something. Totally. You'll actually be. Yeah. A human. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've had, um, I once had, um, I auditioned for something and I just wasn't right for it. It wasn't a bad or extraordinarily good audition. It was just one of those things. And the piano player called me and like took down my like information and called me to like do a concert in Boston that I made, you know, some money doing. He's awesome. like, I love your, you know, you know what I mean? Like little things yeah. like that. So I didn't get that job, but I got some other little random fun excursion out right. of it, you know? Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. So this kind of segues into what is your definition of success? How funny that you're asking me this. Oh my gosh. Okay. I was, do you listen to the ensemblist? I have, I, I have. Yes. And I just recently, okay. I, oh, I need to listen to that again, but yeah. I love, it's I, such I, a great, it's a great podcast. And my buds, Mo Brady and Nika Grafland Zeroni are the hosts. And I was just, as I was getting ready today, listening to the podcast and they did a podcast from Broadway con. Okay. Awesome. And the panelists were all, the show is about ensemblists. It's about like, you know, let's focus on, you know, focusing not on the Sutton Fosters, right. but of I the 12. Make sure everybody understands like ensemblist means people who are in the ensemble, like, in right. the ensemble. like I know right. Molly Tynes has been on it too before who's been on our podcast too. And so they really like the people who are making up the full cast, which is totally so awesome. I love it. The unsung heroes of Broadway, but um, it's a great, it's a great podcast. And they were just having their panels define success. And I was oh, cool. thinking, yeah, it was literally the same question. And every one, every answer I totally agreed with. I was like, yeah, that's the best answer. No, that's the best answer. Oh no, God, that's I'm the so best excited. answer. I'm going to go listen to it. I can't um, seriously. Yeah. It's the Broadway con episode. Um, I commute into work, so I obsess with podcasts. Um, so this isn't something that was on there, but I think my definition of success like varies only because I am so such like I'm not a perfectionist, but I always like want something different. Like um, you know, I'm doing a Broadway show, or I'm doing my one woman show, or I'm doing this web series that I just started. So my definition of success work-wise is always changing. But like, what are the other things that make me successful? I feel successful when people compliment me on my, I have a six and a half year old. And I always feel uh, successful when people compliment me that my daughter has good manners. Yeah. I, you know, she has really good manners. I'm like, gosh, that makes me feel so good. Or, you know, people, you know, write something really nice on my Facebook. There's just like the littlest thing. Like, I think it's about little successes. Like, what was my ultimate goal? to be on Broadway. Great. I can say, I could like die tomorrow and say she achieved her dreams, but there's so many other little successes. Sometimes if I'm really tired and really irritable, it's a success just to get through the show. Right. You know, or it's a success not to like cry on public transportation if I'm like so tired. Um, 
I was just so, talking to another client about this actually, that she like was saying that, you know, depending on where you're at in your life, it is such, there are so many things that make, I didn't ask her this exact question so random, but she brought this up also that she is good at recognizing those successes in others, that someone who is, you know, in, depressed or in that sort of situation, like it really is a success getting out of bed. Yeah. Talked about it, but, um, little successes, little, little goals. Yeah. And then I think of being a teacher and I was just, um, talking to a friend of mine who's just getting into teaching and he taught at this uh, workshop and he said, this girl sang this song and I worked with her and 20 minutes later, she was like a new person. He's like, I felt so good. And my, I truly sit in shows and tear up watching my students be on Broadway or one of my girls was in Madison Square Garden. I'm like, she's 10. And she's up on the stage singing a solo on Madison Square Garden. So that's like another kind of success, like a teacher's success. So it's like the hardest question. I think that I have been successful, but I've so, I like want to touch it all and like taste it all and meet everybody and like do so many other things. I'm like, I'm going to run out of time. Yeah. <laughs> I have to keep, Maybe you know. Feel you. That's the only problem, right? There's yeah. No Someone just like said, I love more than I don't. Yeah, I, that's, that's a, a yeah, that's a good, that's a really good quote. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um. Okay. I ah, so many things I want to talk to you about. Ah. So let's uh let's talk about being a working mom. So when like how I forget had you already done when did Crybaby happen? Yeah, Crybaby happened before Lola, and then Enron was after Lola. I went back to work when Lola. I think I started rehearsals when Lola was six months. Oh my gosh! So when yeah. did you actually audition for Enron? Like the, uh, maybe like a couple months before. So no, Lola was about five months when I was cast, and I went into the show when she was about seven or seven or eight months. She was still a baby. Okay. When you said a couple months before, I thought you meant a couple months before you had her, like you were that. No, 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 no. Because it was a, it was a transfer from London. So it all happens pretty fast. Oh, crazy. Um, yeah. In terms of Broadway shows, because it wasn't a new show it was coming from the West end. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And it all happened. And I, I it's funny because my friend Abby was casting the show and I, rem and I really, really, and I'm not being like all hippy dippy about this. I really believe that having Lola made me a different kind of performer. Lola's my daughter. Yeah. Because I remember I have really bad nerves when I audition. Really bad nerves. And I remember standing outside of the room as a play. And I had the sides in my hand. And my hand was visibly shaking. Like, like the paper was moving. Yeah. And... I was standing outside the door and I was next. And I remember thinking this exact thing. I, I remember thinking, when I get home, I just get to go home and play with Lola. That's so cool. This like doesn't even matter. And I remember this wave of calm coming over me that I had n truly never had before. I'm like neurotic <laughs> auditioner. And I was like, because I, I lived close to the audition. I lived like six blocks away. I'm like, and then I'm going to walk six blocks and I'm going to be home and I just get to play with her. Who cares about this? Right. And then I found out the next day I got it. You know, and I, that's so awesome. And yeah, really it was huge, right? Like, yeah, I really remember that yeah. feeling and I've never been able to replicate it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? I just cussed. <laughs> she gave me this big warning about, about potty mouth stuff. <laughs> Oh, bye, That's Molly. The funniest thing ever, Ellen. You're bringing me back to my past life. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. My open mic. I'm like such a crazy person about it. That's gonna be really funny. Okay. Um. But what I that I was just about to say, like, <laughs> I have another friend who tells a really great story about an audition that he got to, and then he realized once he was there that he actually couldn't do it, like schedule wise. Uh huh. And so. He made, he had that realization outside and he was like, ah, and he said, you know what? I'm just going to stay here and I'm going to have a really awesome time. And I'm going to mm -hmm. make everyone who is my type, I'm going to make them feel awesome. And I'm going to make them have the best audition ever rather than comparing myself to them. Yeah. And he had like the best audition of his life was cast. All this stuff happened, you know? Yeah. And, um, so we were That's talking so about that and being able to help like your mindset stuff, which is so important. And I think that's why I love that list of the 20 things that make you awesome so that it yeah. doesn't have such 
you're not coming into it like begging for the job that you're going yeah. knowing but you can't it, that hasn't happened again it was only that one moment when that happened. it was only that one moment it was that show um i was like that lightning but i because i remember the calm coming over me yeah. and you know, I do go into auditions. The, the calm now that I feel is like, well, I have a really great job. I don't, you know, if I don't get this job, I'm still on Broadway. You know, that I can kind of talk myself out of. But, you know, there's always the back of your mind where you want to be good. You want to look good. You want to sound good. You want, you know, keep, it's just that constant, you know, <clears throat> thing. I, but it's good people to hear too, because I think and that's something that's huge that I work with a lot of non-performers who think mm -hmm. that all performers just have this innate sense of confidence, but it is. Oh my gosh. No exercise, a daily struggle. Yeah, no, it really is. But you know, for anything, I mean, if let's say you were like the best basketball player, right? How long are you going to be the best? I mean, there's always, you always have to work and be better. At, and and that, I, I, again, I don't think that's just for performing. I mean, performing just happens to be consistently competitive because you're constantly on to the next thing. And however, whatever, yeah, know. shows close and the thing comes next. But I mean, however, in any job, you have to keep your skills up. Yeah. Anything, you know, you're never going to be like the best real estate agent or the best stitcher or, you know. Stitcher. Stitcher. Yeah, I like it. Um, okay. So what about teaching? How, when did you start teaching? How did that happen? Um, I, another thing too, with that is that like, I love to be able to help performers to realize that they don't have to wait tables like we did. Yeah. They could do these other things, which as much as, you know, Ellen's was crazy. I know there's great things that it brought to our lives. Oh, for sure. But yeah. Uh, but if you don't find an, a place like Ellen Stardust Diner where you can sing and wait tables at the same time. It was pretty fun. I mean, it's crazy. I can't believe that no one has written a book about it, really. It's no. just like the craziest well, place. Tyler Davis wrote his musical about it, right? Did you know that? What? He wrote a Who did? Book about it. Who did? Steven Tyler Davis. I did not know that. Yeah. I'll, I mean, I think it was like a festival show at some point. But they, they were on ro roller skates, though, so it wasn't really Ellen's. It was, yeah. Oh. It was a John Dominguez, I think, was one of the... <laughs> That's hilarious. There's a John Dominguez. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. Um, what brought me to teaching was I would meet all these kids in my shows that I was in, and they would tell me what their teachers told them. Mm -hmm. And I would say, who taught you to do that? Like what? Like what? I want to know. Like, okay, ready for this? Yeah, I'm excited. I'm not going to One of my students said her teacher told her to sing by squeezing her butt. You know what is so funny that you brought that up? Because what? Because there was just a huge thread about, not a huge one, it was a little thread about this in another teacher um, Facebook group that I'm in. Mm -hmm. Because that is something that does not work for me. But there is another person that I know who teaches who's like done a lot of stuff who talks about uh -huh. it all the time. And I don't, it, I'm like, and I try to be like, okay, different things work for different people. Yes, I do say that all the time. I for sure say that all the time. But I said, okay, so what does that mean? Like, what does that do? Because to me, that's straining. Exactly. And I, my whole technique is based on um, loosening tension, throat tension, tongue tension, forehead tension, loosening tension. And you guys, Ellen can belt her friggin' face up like cray cray <laughs> land. Thank you. No, but so yes, I always say different tech. I always say it's not, not every technique yeah. works for everyone. And I really, really believe that. And I really believe different people connect to different teachers and different methods. So it's not that, but it, it quite literally goes against the opposite of what I believe mm -hmm. because she was telling her to like, I can't even like clench her butt, which like clenches this and like causes tension. And I was like, what does that mean? What? And why are you, why are you telling a child to squeeze their butt. I thought it was inappropriate. And I just thought it was like a weird abstract. So I said, can we just do like a, a, this was like seven years ago. I said, let's just like do a lesson. And I just said, let me like, let me hear your voice and let me hear you and let me assess you. And I sort of like built my style on a couple of kids awesome. because I've studied voice since I was eight years old with some of the best. I studied with Kristen Link later. And I feel, I feel when you grow up, you take gems from different teachers and different styles and what works best for you. And then I started really liking teaching kids because kids come with no baggage mm -hmm. and kids have no, nothing at stake, right? If they go to an audition, they're like, great, I'm going to go have fun. Not like I need to go to this audition to pay my mortgage. Right. Um, so 
I really, really like developed my own style, my own techniques, my own warm ups, which I love your warm ups too. You know that. <laughs> and, um, and I think that, and then I started seeing real results like in my kids and, and then, you know, and you know what it's like, it's yeah. like word of mouth once you get, you know, and then my business just, you know, blew up. My kids got an Annie and Matilda and all these shows. Um, but I mean, I think the thing that I focus on most with kids is real. I don't talk to them like adults, but I don't talk to them like kids. I, I teach them adult like concepts and techniques and I don't know. I don't, you know, pander down. And I tell the parents that too, you know, and they have homework and they have things they need to work on and they need to come prepared. I'm strict with fun. Um, but you know, you, everyone develops their own style and I just like, I'm obsessed with my kids and I think I'm more than a teacher. I'm more of like a friend and a mentor. Cause you know, they'll, they'll text me after their auditions and we'll FaceTime before and they, they, it's really, really like an emotional relationship being a teacher. And that's so important too, I think, because so much of, you know, I have my little Stanislavski chart outside my studio here. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the bottom thing is work on oneself. Like so much of it is really about the support that we need as performers, as human beings. And so, Oh my gosh. Yeah. And they're little tiny human beings. Like they're so little and they're so capable. Like I had like one of my little girls just turned nine. She just booked Matilda on Broadway and she told me when she was seven, I usually don't take seven year olds. I, she, her mom said, do you want to go in for Cindy Lou Who? Do you want to go in for this show? Do you want to? And she went, no, I just want to be Matilda. That was it. She didn't want to be young Cosette. She didn't want to go in for any other show, but Matilda. And she was like, she, did it. she, she literally lived the secret at seven years old. <laughs> And she's, she's going to be opening up Broadway. Existence. That's my favorite. Yes. Oh gosh. I mean, they're amazing. Kids are amazing. They're, they're, they have, you know, you tell them it, it's just, it's then when I teach adults, I don't mind teaching adults, but my joy really comes from teaching yeah. kids because they just get so excited and they give you results and they ask silly questions and I just love it. How do you feel that teaching has affected your performing? It makes me more, I always talk to my kids about bad habits because a lot of kids come to you just like a lump of clay yeah. and singing is like speaking on pitch and some of them just scream or some of them don't have pitch. And then I have to, I ever, you know, breaking a habit is the worst. Right. That is, anybody will tell you, you know what I mean? Like breaking a, a habit, if you have a bad habit, if you, you know, like you smoke or you walk funny or you walk pigeon toed, any kind of habit is so hard to break. So I always talk to kids about breaking habits. And then I started to be very hyperly aware of my own habits yeah. and my own crutches, or if I'm not breathing properly, because I say, I think to myself, well, if I'm teaching these kids how to breathe properly and support, and I'm being a lazy singer, yeah. it made me more hyper, hyper aware of the lazy things that, you know, because I sing the same show eight times a week right. and I know how to flip my voice and I know how to, uh, you know, get through my show. Yeah. But am I always singing with like proper technique? Am I always warming, you know, things like that. So it, 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 it makes me more accountable yeah, for sure. Totally. Do yeah. you feel like it's ever pulled away from your career? Cause I, sometimes when I started, so I had this, I don't know if I've even told you, but I had this online course um, that I just finished the pilot of. It's called Prepared Performer Profits and it's to help performers to be able to launch side businesses. Main uh -huh. And I've had a few people tell me, but if you're going to talk to performers about that, they want to perform. They don't want to do anything else. They don't want to, uh -huh. they don't want to do this. And I've been excited as I've spoken to more people about it who are actually like working performers and also uh -huh. agents and stuff who have said, no, it actually is one of the most beneficial things that you can do to, con to make money in addition to performing because you're flexible with your schedule and stuff. But how do you yeah. think about that? How do you? Um, well, I think I'm a little different only because I'm a mom as well. Oh, so, you. yeah. So um, I think if I didn't, you know, um, we had spoke a little, a little bit about this, about growing my, growing my teaching business, right. um, which I'm really, uh, I, I sort of like cap out on students, but you know, some of my students move away or they sort of like, you know, want to do other things. So I usually have like a cap of amount of hours I can teach yeah, in the week. Teach? Um, I teach between shows and I also have, where do you do it? 
Oh, at a studio. I rent a studio. Yeah. Um, I also teach out of my home, but those are mostly the times are mostly for homeschool kids. Cause in New York, um, a handful of the kids are homeschooled. Yeah. The kids that are on Broadway, not all of them. Some of them go to regular school. Um, and some are just homeschooled because of their life choices. And that's always sure, fun. Sure. I mean, there's lots of kids that are homeschooled. Yeah. And um, so I, I have, like, set hours. I don't teach on my day off unless it's an emergency because I only have, you know, one full day off from work, which is on a Monday. Um, so, yeah. So, I, you know, I have to, like, you know, have time to, you know, go to Trader Joe's and, you know, catch up on bad TV or something. Thank you, uh, Yes. And picker from school and everything. So, um, I think it is what you make of it. I think the, the really fun thing being a performer, even if you're not like a current performer is that I can empathize with the kids. I know what it's like to have a bad audition. I know what it's like to tackle my nerves. I know what it's, you know what I mean? So yeah. I can look at them and I can say like truthfully, like I get it. I know you're, you're putting pressure on yourself, you know, cause these kids are most of my kids are Broadway caliber performers and testing for pilots and they're amazing. Um, and they don't not put pressure on themselves. I mean, they're a little more lighthearted than an adult would be, but they're for sure feel the pressure and they feel the competition and, um, they get down on themselves. So I think being a performer lets them feel that I can have a little bit of a, more of an emotional connection with them. Um, and, you know, they'll call me and text me, and sometimes they're sad, and sometimes they're like, Ellen, I did really well. I don't know what happened. <laughs> and sometimes they are so awesome and confident. I'm like, gosh, why can't I be more like an 11-year-old, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, so I think, I think it's really, really beneficial. It's just the time that can be a little hard for sure. Right, yeah. especially as a mom. Like yeah. 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, hold on. I'm just looking at my little, Ooh, yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about turning tables. Oh yeah. Turning the tables. Uh, turning the tables is my new web series. Uh, that we're on episode two. I watched uh, episode one. It was awesome. I haven't yeah. Seen it yet, but I loved it. Um, it's, uh, basically we turn the tables. There's four actors behind the table. It's on Broadway world and on YouTube and it's four actors behind the table. And we audition casting directors for shows that they cast. And it's really funny and it's mostly improv based. And, um, it's, it was, it's been a thought of mine for a really long time. And, um, I just did my second one woman show called live from Carnegie hall, um, at Joe's pub. And um, my team that I worked with on my previous show called Inappropriate, I told them the idea and they were like, yeah, let's shoot it. This sounds hilarious. Yeah. So I went to a couple of my casting director buddies and I kind of like bullied them into doing it. And um, it's, it turned out so great. It's been such a labor of love. It's been really fun and we've gotten really, really awesome response from it. But it's just like that. You know, I thought I had this idea and it really, it's funny. It really takes people getting behind you and rallying and saying like, you're good enough. Um, you know, you are enough uh, to like kind of like get it going. And I'm so glad it did. And we had this like awesome team. It's um, Catherine Page is my producer and she edits and she like does everything. We had a full set and, you know, three cameras and it was Andrew Chappelle from Hamilton Julia Madison from Godspell and Andrew Bradis, who's annoying actor friend. Is annoying actor yeah, friend yeah. popular out there? Uh, yeah, I I know totally. Especially, yeah, you know, and I think I first found out about it um, when all the equity stuff was going on. Yeah, he's I an amazing it. writer, amazing yeah. writer, and um, so yeah, so we just got together and did it, and it was another one of those things where it was like we did it, we got through it, we edited it, people liked it, and like that's like a success, I guess. Yeah. you know, awesome. So yeah, because I'm talking so much now about like the starving artist idea, um, which I want to talk about that if just really quick too. We're like, I want to talk for 12 hours. <laughs> um, but with that, like, are there ways that you're monetizing that at all? Or is it really just a labor of love and you guys are um, like, is there any fine? Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was picked up by Broadway world so and um, it, we released it independently and then the day we released it Broadway world said we want it to be like an exclusive show on our website okay um and then do they I mean is that the, I feel like there's so many things that are not really spoken about 
in the yeah. money side of things. So I don't know what we're, what you're allowed to talk yeah. about without saying no or anything, but I mean, do they pay for that? How does that work? Like, they, they, um, play, pay a small amount through ads, but the, 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 um, the main thing is, is they're all going to fund season two. Ooh, cool. Um, okay. yeah. So like with it, and when I say fund, I don't mean necessarily like give us money, but like give us equipment that we don't need to rent, like great microphones, great cameras. Space. Um, yeah. And also it's, you know, you're buying into the exposure because right. they have like, so, you know, such a wide viewership. Um, so it's, it's minimally monetized that basically covers our expenses. Mm -hmm. It's not like we make money, you know, we make money from that, but you know, everything is an expense. Our time, Catherine does our editing, yeah. you know, renting, um, microphones. We had a boom mic. We had two microphones on us. If you watch the episode, mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's things like that getting people behind you that you don't always make money, but you don't lose money. <laughs> Which that so, is a good goal. As that's a totally a success for sure. Okay, you know what? That actually reminds me of, remember a couple of weeks ago, I said, I'm, I'm secretly writing this um, book, like um, a, it's a, just a little empowerment book. Yeah. And um, so, which is why I asked on Facebook, if you have words to explain a Broadway performer, like what your words would you use? Because so the, the reason that I asked it is because the book is going to take, it's about bringing a sense of stage presence to your everyday life. So it's right. what performers go through and the, the qualities that an outside person sees that they have, like confidence, you know, poise, whatever, goofiness. But that, all those words everyone was saying. But the word that Ellen said, do you remember this? Yes. Was broke. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Everyone was like glorious, loving, challenged, hilarious, broke. <laughs> Perfect. So, but that is actually probably more truthful as what people, I mean, you know, in the sense of an artist or a performer. It's Listen, yeah. you know, like, I mean, in terms of Broadway, I feel like I've won the lottery being in a show that's running for three years. You know, how lucky am I? That doesn't always happen. I was in three flops. Well, Priscilla wasn't a flop. Priscilla was right. two years, but um, it closed unexpectedly. And um, there are some, gosh, Enron was a, an amazing show. It was so good. And I am not kidding. The talent, I was like, how am I in this room right now? And who knows, you know, the drop of the hat. A Tony Award nominee is unemployed. A Tony Award winner is unemployed. It doesn't, you know, it's yeah. just, it's hard. It's, you know, like I said, you know, like a real estate agent has to like keep their skills up, but you don't lose your job at, at the drop of a hat. I was, um, I was talking to a girl on my show, Galen Gilliland, who's going to be in SpongeBob and she was in Honeymoon in Vegas. They found out on the Tuesday that they were closing on that Sunday. Now, granted, they had been in a lot of trouble what well, didn't come out of nowhere, but you know, all of a sudden you're packing up your dressing room. So what do you tell your students about that who, or their parents as well, who are looking to be professional performers and they want to build a career in that regard? What do you, I am always really probably honest to a fault. I always tell people it takes time. It takes money up front, you know, money for lessons, headshots. A lot of the kids don't live in Manhattan. They live in Westchester or New Jersey and you're commuting and your tolls and your parking and it all adds up and your meals out. And I always say it's truly, truly a big financial investment. Um, especially probably in New York and in Southern California where you are maybe in other parts of the country, not so much, but, but just the for, amount of work that you can get. I yeah. Is, yeah. Like, um, exposure auditions even it's like, you know, like, yeah, it's just everything adds up. And, and, and I always am really honest about that. Nothing is ever guaranteed and it's, it's a lot of money and it's a lot of time, but you know, the rewards are handsome and seeing these kids achieve their dreams. I mean, I am not even their birth parents and I just beam with joy. So I mean, to, a girlfriend of mine, her daughter was a Matilda and now she's um, a Cosette on Broadway. And I can't even put in my mind what that must be like for your daughter to lead a show like Matilda. Right. And watch her and, and watch it through her eyes and watch people. I mean, it, I'm getting choked up thinking about it, but, um, but it's not without its, its demands, financial, emotional time, 
yeah, I'm always pretty upfront about that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if there is anything that you would like, um, you could leave us with about either, uh, just like some, you know, how, what would, what's the message that you would like to share with prepared performers? You with know? prepared performers? Yeah. I, I mean, I think your message is great, being prepared. I mean, as one person who gets really overcome by nerves, being prepared, that's for sure. Um, you have to really, I, I, this might come out negative, but I don't mean it to. You have to really, really make sure that that it, per, per, professionally speaking, if you're just, you know, singing for fun and want to go to karaoke, you know, and sing, you know, just a small down girl, like at the top of your lungs, like more power to you. But just make sure that it's like what brings you joy because, you know, life's too short, you know, just, it doesn't, sometimes I see kids that are really good. They just have these gifts, but it doesn't like put like joy in their heart, you know? And then I see the opposite, kids who find so much joy, but they weren't granted these gifts as readily as some other kids. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be like a meeting of the minds of finding what you're good at. And also you can be a part of performing in the theater community without being front and center. And some kids love that, you know, you could, you know, be a stage manager or learn about, um, you know, lights or sounds. Hello, be a lighting designer. There you go. Um, but yeah, but I mean, if it is what, if it is what you want, then hard work, don't be scared of it, man. What's well, a lot of hard work and all that stuff that you're going to learn by going through all of that will only make you better at the other things that you're doing in your life as well. You know? Yeah. I think, I don't know, but that's a life lesson, right? Right. That's, that's what we're taught. You work hard and you reap rewards, right? Yeah. 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 Spread joy. Yay. Spread joy. I have one more really weird. Sparkle thing. and shine. Oh, shimmer and shine. Yahoo. Shimmer and shine. Shimmer and shine. Which now it's like that cartoon. I've not seen it, but now there's a Nickelodeon cartoon called Shimmer and Shine. Oh, I didn't know that. My life work is ruined. You're, you should have trademarked that. I should have. Um, Dang it. Ah. Okay. Do you, in Kinky Boots, do you cover Lauren? Oh, yeah. Got, yeah. Okay. So I have a student just yesterday by super random chance student of mine was like, I want to work on history of wrong guys. And, um, she, this student of mine is fierce. She's really talented. Uh -huh. And, um, but I've seen a couple of people do it as like a, a solo number either. You know, I did this Broadway themed open mic night. Like people have done it there. I've seen it other places. And sometimes I just feel like it does not work on its own. I, I, I was like, I knew where you were going with that. And I talked to you my associate director all the time about it because uh, I had to do the press for Kinky Boots last summer or two summers ago. Two summers ago, I'd like go to all the cities that the tour was going okay, and cool. I had to sing it. And I have not encountered a song that works so well in the context of a show that does not translate on its own yeah. out of the show. And I have talked to DB about this all the time. He's our associate director at Kinky Boots. It's, a, it's an act. It's an act. She's like boxing the shoes and Charlie is there and she's like, act. And then the it's real. I do not blame your student for wanting to sing it because it's a really fun song to sing and it's really catchy. Yeah. However, it really does not lend itself to being an out of context solo. Sure, right. And I didn't realize it until I heard like someone was going to sing it one time and I was like, Oh, I'm so excited. I told yeah. you, this song is so funny. It's amazing. And then I was like this and she was fine. Like the girl who sang it was fine. It was just, I was like, this isn't working. And everyone's looking at me like I'm crazy. Cause I just said this song was so funny, but um, yeah, I told my student yesterday, I said, okay, but because you're fierce, we're going to make this a challenge. And so we're going to like, she's doing it. Uh, oh, sh I'm not going to say who she is. Cause I she's auditioning with it for something not for like a talent show thing and um she uh I was like let's see if we can find ways like how can we like you pull a fan out of your hand a fan out of your pocket or you bring like I don't know is, do you think what did you do on the on the tour thing that you were doing I honestly just like I just sort of like egged it up a bit and like made like a little bit more over the top funny faces than I normally would in the show like oh no you don't dare. 
Like, and I just try to made it like not, but it was a little eggy. It's a little eggy because, and I and I talked to my associate, and he's yeah. like, "It is what it is." Right, and, and like, it's people who know the show will come into it with that knowledge at least. But yeah, and like the and the love is good, and ah, I sort of like have a little like spaz attack there, and um, yeah, it's the only girl number, um, solo girl number in the show. Yeah, because what is um. My brain isn't working right now. Uh, the girlfriend, Nicola. Nicola. Yeah, she has like one little teeny tiny solo. <laughs> yeah, in the beginning, she actually had a song that was cut in Chicago. It was a beautiful song. I really liked it. But um, yeah, she didn't doesn't have a song. So it was super weird. I totally agree with you. You're not wrong. Yeah. I was like, oh. Yeah. Do it, but. <laughs> no, it's eggy for sure. We'll just bring, maybe she'll just scramble eggs while she does it. That'll be good. Perfect. Something. I don't know. Maybe like turn it into a hula dance. I don't know. Something out of context and silly. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I'll let you know what we come up with. Okay. Um, cool. Okay. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. You're amazing. I'm going to stop yeah. the recording and then um, we'll say goodbye offline too. But okay. Okay. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.